I call David Garrett. Mr Chairman, um, I want to start this contribution uh, by acknowledging and putting on the record Mr Cosgrove said earlier that he believes uh, that everyone in this House sorry, I'll start again, that no one in this House would not be on the side of victims. And I, I wish to put on the record that I believe that. Uh, I don't believe that Mr Robertson, Mr Hipkins or Mr Cosgrove, for that matter, uh, are unsympathetic to victims. So that's the spirit in which I'm standing. And I thank Mr, Mr Robertson for his gracious acknowledgement of my uh, sincerity of belief, which lies behind the bill. I want to talk just briefly, Mr Chairman, about the deterrence, which with the greatest of respect to the Minister, who I respect greatly, <laughs> I don't think she explained uh, as well as she might um, the, the um, use that's been made on the other side of the statements in the explanatory note uh, that there is no deterrence uh, calculated or predicted. Now, the reason for that is I'm sure the other side knows, perhaps Mr Robertson not sitting on the committee may not, the predictions of bed numbers arose, Mr Chairman, by the Department of Corrections putting through a computer model offender statistics for the last 30 years. And in that model they inserted the three strikes bill as it is now. So they ran those offender statistics, hundreds of thousands of them, through the model as if there'd been a three strikes bill. And, it sp and then extrapolated that forward assuming that those trends would, that, that those stats would continue for the next 30, or the next 50 years, I'm sorry. And that's where those bad numbers come, 140 over 10, 288 over 20 years, 725 over 50. I'm not going to make any points in this contribution about distortion of numbers, because that's not what I stood to say. But the fact that there's no deterrence assumed is you simply can't. What would there be a point putting into the model we'll assume a deterrent effect of 10% or 20 or 30. It would simply be a guess and it would be dishonest. It would be absolutely, utterly dishonest and that really would be spin. So the only thing you can do there, Mr Chairman, and, the, and what was done is treat, look at stats from 30 years ago, run them through the model with the three strikes and see what the numbers spit out. But I want to come on to parole, which is what this part's about. Um, there's been lots of talk about and, and uh, it, the point on the other side has been well made. The Sentencing Act does indeed make it clear, uh, in a, a one subsection at least, that parole uh, is a privilege and not a right. I want to remind the House, though, Mr Chairman, that two of the most heinous crimes in this country were committed by parolees. And I refer, of course, to William Bell and Graham Burton. I think it's worth reminding the House of the circumstances that occurred with both of those. In Bell's case, 102 previous convictions. He was paroled for badly beating a service station attendant. The service station attendant went and hid in the toilet. He gave him the money, but because Bell's a psychopath, Bell wanted to see blood. And the guy barricaded himself in the toilet. Bell busted in the door and beat the you-know-what out of him, severely injuring him. That was the crime for which William Bell was paroled in 2001. And when he showed up at the Mungary Probation Service office, he was assigned to an inexperienced young female probation officer. He walked into the office. She handed him over his special conditions. He laughed, rolled them into a ball, threw them at her head and left. That's what Bell did. And within months, He'd killed three people at the Panmere RSA and damn near killed a fourth. He had no intention of Susan Couch surviving. Susan Couch is maimed beyond belief, and I'm not going to discuss her medical condition in this house, but I know about it. Bell walked in there undisguised, and he'd been working there uh, for three months, so everyone knew him. The only reason you go to a place where you've been working and, you're and you are going to be identified is you don't plan to leave anyone alive. That's one parolee. Graham Burton is a psychopath also. He, he killed in Wellington here in 1992, walked into a nightclub, decided that some poor inoffensive chap, a fairly slight guy I believe, didn't like the look of him or he'd given him the wrong kind of look or something and stabbed him with such violence that the knife came out his back. And Bell being a huge man 
uh, lifted the guy off the ground. That was Bell's crime, and he went to jail for that. Mr. Chairman. David Garrett. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, what uh, Burton did was actually even more sinister than Bell. He got hold, effectively, of the answer book. He had had interviews with psychologists. He's an intelligent man. I've actually met him through a, a steel grill. He's an intelligent man. What he did was he got hold of the answer book so he could fake empathy. So he knew what to say when he was asked, how do you feel about this picture? What do you feel about this situation? What are your emotions here? He knew what to say. And he fooled the parole board and he got out and he killed Carl Klockenbecker and damn near killed two other people as well. So there are two failures of parole. So we make no bones about the fact that this is a, set, this is a um, system which has steps. I'll remind the House again, step one, no change from now. Someone convicted of ag rob the day after this bill is passed will be treated no differently from today, except that they get a warning. They are warned formally on their file that they have a warning. They're eligible for parole under the Sentencing Act 2002. It is fair to say that they probably won't get it first time, but they'll get out under parole and they certainly won't serve their full sentence. The second time, no parole. We make no bones about that. That's a jump from there, first time, second time. Take away that privilege. The other side has agreed that it is a privilege. That is removed at the second time. It is a disproportionate sentence, people have said, and they're right. It's deliberate. That's the point they miss. It is deliberately disproportionate because it is your second time. If you come out and do it again, this time you get the maximum, and that's disproportionate. A third time ag robber gets this much, a second time ag robber gets this much, a first time ag robber gets that much. It's deliberate, Mr Chairman. That's the point. It's disproportionate because you keep on offending and you don't learn and you don't change your ways. So uh, as Mr Hyde has said, eventually at that point you have to be locked up to protect society. But it's not forever. The 25 year to life sentence that we unashamedly promoted is gone. What we have instead is the maximum prescribed in this House in 1961. The government sat here and passed the Crimes Act 1961 and they set the penalties. It was a bit simpler in those days. They didn't have a whole pile of acts at all in the Crimes Act. So this House said the maximum penalty for aggravated robbery should be 14 years. Mr Hipkins, you find someone who's received anything like 14 years in the past 20. You'll look in vain. The Crimes Act says that the penalty for rape is 20. You find a rapist who's got anything like 20 in the last 20 years. You will look in vain. So this is an unashamed, disproportionate form of uh, san sanction. First step this, next step's much worse, third step's much worse than that. That's the point, Mr Chairman. Uh, David Clendon.